We continue with the program and we go to uh, another success story about the Danube River. And uh, Mr. Manzano will uh, give a presentation about the Danube Integrated Development and River Restoration. Carl Manzano is a trained biologist and director of the Donau Auer National Park that lies between the two European capitals, Siena and uh, Bratislava. For a distance of more than 40 kilometers, the Danube flows freely and forms the lifeline of the National Park. Carl was involved in the efforts to establish the National Park in the early mid-1980s in the subsequent planning activities. He has served as a park director since its establishment in 1996-1997. And under Carl's stewardship, management has initiated a series of exemplary river restoration projects in close cooperation with the Danube Waterway Company. That's where you're going to speak about. Please go ahead. Thank you, Bob. Welcome. To Vienna, welcome to the Danube, and for those who will be with our free trip tomorrow, welcome to the Donau National Park. If you, if you have a look at our region from the air, you can see the very special, if not unique, situation of our national park. It's the only one in the world, as far as I know, the only national park that connects two national capitals. Vienna and Bratislava. Also, it connects the Alps, the, the western, uh, the eastern range of the Alps, to the most western part of the Carpathians. And what's most important, it's one of the last free-flowing stretches of the river of the Upper Danube. And we have a hydropower plant, Greifenstein, above one hydropower plant in Vienna and Gapchikovo power plant below, uh, yeah, which was talked about already. So, this is the Danube in Vienna. That's where we are. <laughs> so that's the challenge. Um, obviously, we will not be able, if we look around here, we will not be able to live up to the challenge to restore the Danube as a real natural river in, in, in Vienna, but maybe down in the National Park. This is a few, uh, 40 kilo, 30 kilometers further down, where we'll be tomorrow. The map is even older from the beginning of the 19th century. But this landscape has changed. That's the Danube as it is, or better, as it was at the beginning of the National Park, a channeled river. Uh, the regulation was done in the late 19th century. You have side-arm systems, but they are cut off from the main channel. Only a few days a year uh, the water is flowing, and you have uh, groins uh, for, for navigation. And what we have is very large riverine forests along, especially along the left bank. So, it, it needed, yeah, one and a half centuries to go this way. Is there a way back, and how far can this way back go? So the main obvious constraints are flood protection and navigation. It's an international waterway. Nobody wants more uh, to increase the dangers of floods. In fact, there are more constraints, as I will, constraints, as I will show later. But there is a big restoration potential, and it's mainly riverbank restoration, sidearm restoration, and the modification of groins and spur dikes. Since the park was established in 1996, um, a lot of projects have taken place. I can't go into detail, and there's one project ongoing, um, another pilot project, pilot project we will see tomorrow. What's special about these projects that they have been done from the very beginning in close cooperation between National Park Administration and the Waterway Agency, uh, now Via Dona. And 
It, all these projects have been supported by European funds. That was also an important driver. Sometimes applying the national park for the funds, for example, for the life grant. Sometimes applying uh, the, the waterway agency uh, grants from the DG transport. So this was an integrated approach from the very beginning and all the technical planning and the main driver and the main interest was conservation, but the technical work and the planning, all this was done by the waterway agency. Um, of course, we have very, let's say, favorable conditions, special favorable conditions, since we are a national park, and Natura 2000, of course, as well. So we have a high level of legal protection, and also, in our case, a high political sensi sensitivity because some of, may, of you may know the Heimburg uh, discussion in the 80s and 90s. So our region has really, yeah, it's a very important issue for the whole environmental movement in Austria. And in a national park, by definition, we don't have no conflict with land use, like forestry, hunting, farming, or build up areas. So that makes it much easier to concentrate on the integration of navigation and, and, and conservation. I can say a lot about these land uses, how we develop this in the national park, but there's no time for this today. So this was the first project in 1996, according to the documents worked out in the planning phase of the national park, Re reconnection of cutoff side arm and what was done to lower the riprap structure to have a better inflow uh, into the side arm system. From today's view, this is, yeah, this is not radical enough, this is too cautious, but at this time it was a kind of revolution because it was the first time up to this day, up to this project, everything was done on the dam was to increase, to fortify the dam. And that was the first project to, to reverse this trend. And there was years of discussion and many, many objections and many, many anxieties. And the anxieties have also a, an, had, had an exp, a expression in concrete structure. So this is the concrete anxiety. What was really needed to have a fixed inflow that you can control and so we we were not very happy with this from the beginning but that was the only way you could do it um, but once it was realized everybody so it's not so much it's yeah it's fine and so the next project uh, of restoration of side arms in 2000 2002 became much more radical this is all this is uh, the riverbank and the same view. So the old in inflow of a side arm system was restored on, on three different pieces, and there's no structure anymore, or hardly there's some structure if you look, but uh, in fact, no structure, no barrier. So this is the first time that the whole side arm system from the inflow to the off outflow, of about three kilometers up downstream. All the, all the obstructive uh, elements built in by the regulation were uh, eliminated. And of course, <coughs> within the SIDAM system, uh, a very dynamic development started immediately. The next step, again building up on the previous experience, was to take away the riprap completely not only on a certain spot where the sidearm flew in 100 uh, years ago, but for a length of three kilometers. And the idea was, if you take it away, then a natural <coughs> riverbank will, will be created by the river. And this is the area opposite of Hamburg. You see a, a riprap structure all the way for, for three kilometers. And from here is a look, to, if you look at close, not a very friendly structure, neither for 
animals, no for men. It's not nice to swim here, to bathe here, yeah, to spend the time on the river. And this is not so nice, but sometimes you have no other choice. And yeah, you need big machines to do that. About 50,000 cubic meters of stone structure were eliminated. And don't forget, this is one is in the core zone of the national park, a no intervention zone. So in the no intervention zone, all these caterpillars and big lorries <laughs> moved in to do something good. Um, after the work was done, it looked like this, not very nice. This is here, you know, the, the, the roots of all the trees that were cut down. And they had to be brought. You, you, you're not allowed to let them rotten in the park. They have to, yeah, yeah, you have to do something with it. But today it looks like this. You have about 30 meters of riverbed erosion. In fact, a few months after the first flooding, it looked more or less like this. And we have a typical uh, river bank as it's supposed to be on our river here with and, uh, the gravel banks and the steep slopes. That's what we like to. And the third um, group of measures uh, was the modification of groins. Um, there's a lot to say about this. And the first project was done in 2007 to 2009. And there's also an ongoing project experiment with, uh, on these grind structures. So if we sum up very roughly the results of all this, I mean, it would be very interesting to go in depth about the biology, biological effects of all these measures. What you, what's obvious, we haven't in, recreated or made it possible again an intense dynamic landscape process, of course, on a local level, on a limited space near the river, 30, 40 kilometer, uh, meters of riverbed erosion and also the side arms, at least in the upper parts of the reconnected side arms, we have a, we have a strong <laughs> morphological dynamic. And as it should be, the typical habitats reappear, like river bars, steep river banks, and also large woody de debris, so all the trees falling into the river, even in the navigation route that, of course, is subject to some discussion. And there is a quick, if not immediate, biotic response. And this, for example, this project, the first time since, I don't know, decades or centuries, the bee eater was breeding on, on a Danube river bank in our area. Unfortunately, the flood came and it was not successful. So <laughs> the kingfisher is more successful. But there are some less known species like this, this spider, which is typical for greater things. They all can be found there if you have the funds to do proper monitoring. And yeah, can you, you know, maybe some of you know this. What, what, what's this? Yeah, these are the eggs of the little ring plover. This is a nice little bird breeding on this open uh, gravel bars. And in two years ago, we made a Daniel White transnational survey on this species uh, in the framework of our network of protected areas, Daniel Parks. And these were the results of, of this survey. And it shows very clearly, which is evident anyway, where the, the dynamic structures of the River Danube, where there are the red ones here, are the, all the, the dams, you don't find any. And here is our national park and the free flowing uh, stretches. Yeah, there you find these birds. And we were very happy and proud that, at least in this year, um, the highest density was in our national park, in one of the restored area. And this is within a side arm system, and there the weight wash is not effective, so they have even better conditions than on the Danube River Bank. 
This year it was done again. This year we are not the best because we have high water levels, so there were hardly any. So you have to be a bit cautious about these results. But the basic uh, message is clear. So our project uh, drew very much international and national attention. Um, and you will be the next guests tomorrow. We'll do the excursion in such a boat, so be prepared for this. And it will probably not be as sunny as it was. It is. The problem with the Chinese is usually they don't like to paddle, you know, if they have a <laughs> <laughs> You have some cultures where if once you're in a certain position, you don't paddle anymore. <laughs> But then it's also very, very difficult to steer the boat, right? Okay, but that's not you. Um, so what's even more important that there were our project did really inspire others directly. These are our colleagues from from Slovakia, and there's a very uh, initiative uh, NGO Bros, and they came us came to us, saw our project, and initiated a smaller one, only a few hundred uh, meters, but still a uh, ri um, riverbank restoration project down in, on the Slovakian Bank. And this is important, this exchange of examples, because if you look at the river Danube, down uh, in the middle and the lower Danube, many of the riverbanks are not fortified and it should be kept like this. And in some places, like here in Romania, in Sulina Channel, they are just being fortified. This photo has been taken two years ago, and there are German companies you know, <laughs> doing good, reinforcing the Sulina Channel. So this exchange of examples, to our view, is important, and it's a question what kind of example you give. So, if you look at it from above, this is one uh, the restored area. Yeah, it looks very nice. And in a way, it looks a bit similar as it used to be. But if you take a closer look, you will find also the limits. This is a picture from 1941. Inflow area of the uh, uh, Saddam system in Oat. You see lots of water, all this area. If you go 1997, all that water has disappeared. It's all land. And here we started the restoration project to reopen this, this inflow area. And that are the results. And if you compare them to the former uh, water amount, and this is not so long ago, it's 1940. Yeah? Uh, 41. So it's, yeah, it's just a bit, yeah. And another constraint is that's the same area. We have dynamic structure, we have new sidearm systems, but at many times of the year, or there's too many times of the year, even now, the Danube is too low so that the water doesn't flow in. The upper parts of the system stay dry, and obviously. This is of limited benefit for the aquatic communities. They don't really, yeah, it's not really the place for aquatic communities, and <laughs> especially for the rheophilic communities, because they really need sidearm systems who are connected with the main river all the year through. And this is a severe limit, and the problem behind is, of course, bad incision, we have an ongoing bad incision, and even since the mid-80s, when the whole discussion about national parks started and power plant, up to now, we lost half a meter. And that's, yeah, that's not nothing, and that affects severely also the restoration project. It's because of the distorted sediment uh, balance due to all the power plants upstreams, and of course, all the navigation requires this navigation channel, also that has an influence. So it always was the question, 
how to find a really integrated approach and to bring all these problems together and to find solution in one big project. And this big project was designed in the years 2004 and to 2006, also in a common effort of National Park and as a main project uh, driver, the, the Via Dona. And it should contain, it should fulfill all the expectation, improve ecological status, improve navigation, and uh, solve the problem of riverbed incision. So there is a lot of measures, sidearm restoration, riverbank restoration, then causing of bed load, modifying river training structures, modifying the grinds, and also the dredging and dumping of gravels. So this was all put together in one project for the whole stretch of the Danube for the 40 or 45 kilometers. And this is a truly integrative project it's innovative and it's comprehensive. And it's supposed to be a win-win situation. Unfortunately, this project has not been realized yet. And my thesis is it's because it is integrative, it is innovative, and it is comprehensive. <laughs> we had a very special Austrian political discussion about this project where I can't go in depth. But if you look at the project left, that's the project, yeah? There's a few thousand pages of paper. <laughs> I don't know how many square meters of maps and drawings. And probably there's not even a handful of people who have read and seen that all. Most of the people see this, yeah? So it's a comprehensive project, but nobody, it's very difficult to comprehend. <laughs> and if it's an integrative uh, project, there's always the su suspicion of compromise and foul compromise, so the element of trust. And if it's innovative, it's new, it has never been done before that way, so there's this element of insecurity. And all, that, all this comes together, it might be very difficult to implement such a project. So, of course, you, you need an intensive discussion with stakeholders. This is taking place. <coughs> there are stakeholder boards, both of the National Park and of the Via Dona, dealing with those questions. And there's some success, because in this, this year, the first, uh, a new pilot project is implemented, and for the first time, this addition of new gravel is done in a certain stretch of the Danube as an experiment, but not as a solution for the whole thing. So if we sum up, we see a consequence of projects, one after the other, during the years, and with growing intensity and also growing uh, effects on the floodplain and on the river. Uh, and this is the whole story. One, uh, one project after the other. This is going on now. And if we conclude, then whether I may like it or not, the step-by-step -step approach was more successful as the comprehensive integrated approach. Unfortunately, but that's the way it was. And the fact that the project is implemented and the example of an implemented innovative project boosts river restoration stronger than any new concepts or conference even, and also creates a new freedom of action. Yeah? Once yeah, when a project is successful, you can go on much further in the next pro project. And the real, so-called realistic potential of river restoration, even on an international inland waterway, is much wider than it was, or maybe still is, understood some years ago. I, preparing this presentation, I looked up the planning documents for the National Park from 20 years ago, and almost not only the first project was envisaged. All that came after was not even imagined at this time, although all the important experts in ecology, water engineering, were in the planning group. So it, our horizon is 
always too small, we always can widen our horizon. However, there are main constraints, and if you go on, you feel these constraints even stronger. The basic regulation stru structure has to be kept, and that's bitter for a braided river. Yeah, a river that's supposed to be a braided river, uh, and this sets certain limits. Then all the question of flood protection, not so much a question in our case. Land, will, land use, of course, but not so much in our case. Then, and this is our main problem, the disturbed sediment balance and the ongoing bed erosion and also the accumulation of fine sediments. The hydrology has altered, or that mainly to the detriment of some important species. And the migration barriers for riverine species, species and on the other side, you have species that migrate, that can migrate, but are not so wanted, the invasive neobiota. And also a type of problem, ship wave wash, which you can compensate with some good structures, but not completely. Yeah, so you can make very much progress on local level, but there is no overall solution on, le on local level. And for all these problems, you need a large-scale approach. Yeah, thank you for your attention.